Welcome everybody to another uh, chaos community to do group meeting. Uh, I am your facilitator, Gary, and we have some great things on the agenda. Let's jump right in. Um, first one, we have Augur and Eight Knot updates as relevant to the OSPO from Sean. Yeah, just um, real quick. I mean, we went through um, Augur and Eight Knot. Do you want to give an overview of what it is first for people that may not know? Sure, sure. So. Um, Chaos has uh, tools that we use to gather data about repositories and provide metrics um, that are sort of pre-baked. Um, and any OSPO that wants to get data on 8Knot um, can. So um, the kinds of things that 8Knot um, gives you out of the out of the gate and I don't know if I should share my screen here or I can't remember which group I've done this you've done it here I was, it was mostly just like kind of where you're at yeah so what have I been mean, kind of been the questions you've been addressing with respect to OSPO through the software um with res respect to OSPO we really I mean eight knot and auger um really address contributor growth and new contributors. So any repository that you want to track, you can. I think I've been over that in this group before. And um, we've just kind of updated a bunch of the metrics. So you can look for really, I mean, any, if you don't, I'm not going to show you how to do it, but you can create like an Augur account. Um, that would have a, a group in it with your username. And so I can kind of look at the chaos trends this way for the chaos project. And then over here, I have uh, drive through contributors and first time contributors with the different types of contributions and drive by or repeat contributors over time. And then we have a metric called project velocity that we've introduced. It kind of just looks at the weighted PR issue actions and the total commits um, over time gives you an idea of which projects are moving the quickest. I mean, those are the those are the things that we're adding and um, we're starting to do some design work around the starter metrics that Don Foster designed. Um, and so that's you'll see some things like that. I think there's also some work happening with network analysis um that you'll start to see uh, in that front end and um yeah that's it that's kind of the update from a ospo point of view brian you have a question i just adding on to what sean said which is all accurate so because the not part of this is being developed in our ospo at red hat i wanted to mention um that on the non-technical side we and sean was in this meeting yesterday one of our largest upstream projects, Fedora, um, we'll be working with them to ascertain what they need for community help, but in a, but which is what we should be doing. But then on a meta sense, what I hope to bring to this group, I hope, is how do we, like, how do we in OSPOs look at community help? Like, what are some commonalities? And, and then how do we sort of help projects figure out what they need? Because I think for at least, I'm only speaking for me, we, we, we sort of just assumed, oh yeah, you need this, this, and this for community health, but not everybody um, seems to get that. Um, the people over in the Fedora project don't. So I'm beginning to think in terms of building some kind of document or workflow to help guide people to find out, you know, figure out which things are important for their particular project within the overall chaos framework. If that's clear. It is. I have a, maybe I have a question on that. So, um, so Don had just provided, um, for a scientific software community. Don Foster is the director of data science who is here at the Chaos Project. And Don had just provided um, 
kind of a, a document that you're talking about, Brian, which is the starter project health yeah. metric model. So it's right. four relatively straightforward metrics that I think Dawn had used when she was at VMware oh. to just kind of get a general sense of just kind of positioning herself in the communities that she cares about to right. observe. And, and, and I'm, yeah, and I'm definitely cognizant of that and I'm going to work, and I should have said, okay. I'm going to work with her and, and that work group too. Okay. Uh, to do that it's, and not do this solo. Yeah, because like if we can get those particular four metrics and ensure that they're in Augur 8 not, then that model can be developed pretty mm -hmm. straightforwardly because the metrics are there. Um, one of the things that she did provide, and we had kind of done this earlier in chaos, it, it didn't work real well, which was trying to provide like feedback on those metrics in the model. Like some ins, like here's kind of what we're seeing. And you might want to think about this, whatever this might be. Um, so she, she had provided it for one community in the num focus space. But it's it's kind of an like a personally expensive proposition to do that for, for every community to have somebody look at the results, reflect on them, and provide that feedback. So, do you have thoughts on how maybe we could do that? Because that's what I heard you saying that you might want to provide. My knit well, without knowing about like the like, I would need to talk to y'all a bit more about that previous effort and figure out, you know, what your, what the overhead or the expense was for that in terms of uh, resources. Um, I, my approach was to, to, before I heard you say that was to actually take a sampling and, and try this out on some projects and see if I could get, see if we could get to a unified or unified process. Um, but having heard you just tell about that prior effort. Now I'm not sure if that is the correct approach, but I typically, I mean, so yeah, I don't have a good answer for you right now because this, this just sort of occurred to me and Sean was in this meeting yesterday. Not every community embraces the idea of community health um, in the same way. I think everybody wants it, but it's one of those things where they don't, they know they need it, but they don't know what they want or they actually need, if that makes sense. Um, so that's why I'm, and I know I'm hemming and hawing a little bit around this point, but yeah, I would like to work with this group and the data science work group and anybody else. I think that's something we need to approach so people understand what they're getting and understand what they can have at the same time. Yeah. It's a little early. I don't have a solid plan yet. So I think, I think some of it, uh, it comes back to, Angie I have all her, Angie had her hand. Go ahead. And, go ahead, Angie. Yeah, I was just, I was saying from like an end user mm -hmm. perspective. So I've been, my background is I've been in community work for many, many, many years. I was with the Drupal project for a very long time. Now I'm doing open source data communities, that kind of thing. From an end user point of view, what would be very helpful is either a playbook or a set of playbooks that's like, hey, you have a community. Here's what community health means. And this is why you might want to pay attention to that. Here are four recommended metrics is what I see here that you should track on all your community. And if they're not doing the, if the graph is not going the way you want, here are three things you can do about each one. Something like that, if that was like the outcome would be really beneficial and helpful because it sounds like you're, you're calling out not everyone agrees. Not everyone even knows that community health is a thing they should think about. That's like one set of the problem. The other set of the problem is not everyone agrees on the metrics that should be measured. Um, is another set of problems. And maybe it's not one size fits all. Maybe if you're a small fledgling community, you look at these things. If you are a massive community with way too many people to keep track of, you look at these things. You know, you could try splitting the fork in the road or whatever. But I feel like producing some kind of a document or talk or something out of the end of it that gets people like me on the front lines, like a really obvious, this is why I would use this technology and look at what it can do for me just by standing it up. That's amazing. And also I'm, you know, we have this great community you can plug into to like, you know, help you wrangle people and stuff like that. That would be, if you're looking for like an outcome based 
thing. That would be something that I think would have a lot of value outside of this group. That's great. Uh, Sean, I think you had jumped in for a second with a comment there. I think I think that there's a theme um, that really arises, and it's why we have Don doing her data science role now, which which is people wanting to understand the health of their projects, but not being able to articulate how that is, or having some ways that they've done it historically that they still rely on. Um, and so, you know, with the group that Brian was discussing that we spoke with yesterday, kind of what I encouraged them to look at chaos as is kind of like a Costco for metrics. Like what what health is for your project or your ecosystem or your your portfolio is is a function of the things that you care about in your sub communities at a moment in time and it can change. And I think um, you know, knowing knowing that or recognizing that is part of the challenge of making sense of all the data that's available to an OSPO because you have to you have to narrow it you have to narrow what you do in in some ways if that makes sense like you can't produce all the metrics and um, that's that um uh, Brian, did you have a comment other than raising your hand and then doing a thumbs up? Um, I did, but then I realized we were getting into the weeds, but I, I wanted to follow up conversation with Angie about the multiple playbook idea because I think that adds some merit, but I realized that was probably getting into the weeds too much. Well, I, actually, I was curious about this playbook too. I, oh, so, so go ahead and, <laughs> if you want to ask your... Yeah, we have time. Yeah, ask your question. Go ahead, Brian. Well, I mean, so one of the things that I've found um, in my experience is, um, you know, communities have different overarching goals. Like when I was running over, I was looking for, I was running a user-based community and consumptive base, and we're trying to do that. Others are looking for more contributors. That is that what you're kind of thinking about? Like the playbooks would be um, based around those meta arches uh, of, uh, story arts, so yeah, to speak. I'm, I'm not sure which meta arts to focus on because you're right. It could be a user versus a contributor community. It could be a stage of growth. You know, for example, if you are Fedora, you have hundreds of thousands of people in your overall thing and making sense of that much data is very difficult. And you are much more focused on things like say bus factor versus if you are a brand new fledgling community, you would be happy for anyone to be in your GitHub repo at all. And you're trying to attack it from building engagement and, and stuff like that. So um, that's why I was thinking maybe it's more about the the size of the community rather than the goal. Because as you mentioned, people's goals are all over the place of what they're trying to do. But in general, it's like move that number up and to the right, right? Like, <laughs> um, or whatever number it is. Um, but yeah, that was just what I was thinking is um, like, I know I, I, I attended Dawn's talk at Fosse and she talked about the CNCF, for example, has like three different templates for a governance for an open source project and one is like you're a single bdfl of one one is you've got you know a little bit of a community there you want to put some actual governance and like one is like your kubernetes or whatever i mean it was like on a spectrum so if it were something like that where some of the content is the same regardless where it's like everybody should understand why measuring community health is important right but if you made it um, so that the metrics that you gather, because that's your number one problem when you come into something like chaos is there's so much data and you have no idea which of the 17 boxes you just showed are the right ones to focus on for your goals. So just breaking it down and maybe it's problem versus solution. Like my problem is I don't have enough engagement. Okay, well, here's what you look at to measure that. And here's how you make it go up. My problem is I have too many people and I wanna find the people that need help the most or whatever it, and just kind of break it down that way. But I think the more you can base around like problem solution rather than like up here with all of the buffet of options, like getting opinionated about it and saying, this is what you should do in the situation. And if this doesn't fit for you, there's a million other things you can do too, but. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's just me spouting off. Sorry. <laughs> so. so when you were when you were talking, Angie, I just kind of put down like a, I just drew a three by three matrix 
which was like around age of community and size of community. I don't know if those are proper, <laughs> but then there's like a, a, a potential guidebook that would reside in each one of those. And yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, right. I know it, like, or it, kind of imperfect here, but something along those lines. Um, the problem solution matrix, I'm not sure quite what that would look like yet, but I like that as well. Like you're trying to attract more contributors as a thing you're trying to solve. I'm not sure what that matrix would look like yet. Um, and I, I do like the idea of playbooks as well. In the chaos project, we do have a little bit of an issue, like how far out we can reach with what we say to people. Um, but I think the playbooks do kind of extend and aggregate the metrics in a way that could be meaningful for communities or organizations looking to understand um, something. So I, I like that a lot. Um, so thanks for that. In the past, I feel like we've handled those sorts of things in more conversational settings or presentation settings. Um, so I, I personally love panels for this just because there's so many different perspectives and things that you could be working on. Um, so then you can get four answers instead of one. <laughs> Uh, which maybe is like doesn't help with the Costco problem, um, but it does provide a little bit more of a concrete. This is the problem you're trying to solve. These are the metrics that we were gravitating toward, and these were the things that actually were helpful in the end. Because I think anytime I answer a question like that, it's so specific on what are you trying to achieve anyway, kind of thing. It's how we choose the metrics, and for the projects I support, they're looking at totally different things. <laughs> like we've kind of taken more of a like there are some baseline things that everyone should know, like population. But I think in terms of what you're trying to change is how I guide people toward specific metrics, like ones that are focused more on, like, and I, I bring up this example a lot. I work at a large company. We have projects that we run that are also open to external col collaborators. So how do we as a company ensure that we are providing a similar experience for those who can't reach out to another colleague inside a company and ask a question? Like, you just have so much less support as an external contributor. So looking at sort of productivity metrics from an inside and outside of Google Lens helps us to know how well we're doing with things like documentation, guidance, and process. Uh, and so like, it really just depends on what you're trying to achieve and how you're measuring health. But um, I don't know, I, I like the idea of playbooks. I just would be concerned about the amount of work that takes um, versus like, I think we've had some of these conversations in uh, panels, at conferences, and in chaos casts. And I think that's kind of how we've done it in the past, but I think, maybe we could do something in the middle uh just but i don't I, I think it's a good idea it's just like it sounds like a lot of work honestly even the set of questions you just raised would be valuable for people to be like ask yourself this do you know what i mean because what i'm just thinking is like in terms of broad because i never heard of chaos before i randomly come across it in the hallway at open source summit right but there are conferences that are about community management and developer relations and all of this. And you could go to CMX Summit with like, bam, here's the five things you need to ask yourself about your community. And here's exactly how to get it lined up, downloaded here. You know, like that sort of thing would be really cool to get the word out. But I get it's a lot of work, so fair enough. So okay. Go ahead and put a comment in the chat as well. Note that. Yeah. Anything more to add there, Tabitha? No, I think it kind of got touched on with uh, sort of all of the other feedback that came up about the playbook, and it sort of got filled in anyway. So. We, um, we do have that that framework for metrics that we've been sharing here. You know, it used, we used to call it a maturity model, but we moved away from that yeah. just because um, just different organizations are just going to always be in different stages. But I do like this idea around stage of growth or like age of a community, thinking along those lines. I'm not, and people can self-select into that where they kind of feel they are um, and providing that guidance because I... I agree, like the starter project health metric model probably, well, may not be terribly helpful, say in a Kubernetes context, like it just might not be the right model to apply in that situation, but okay. So thank you. Wow. That was a, that was a deep discussion with a lot of input. Thanks everybody for 
uh, getting into it. I, I feel like it was it was very helpful for digging into this topic. Um, Matt, you have the next one. Yeah, so I uh, I wanted to start another conversation here. So uh, we we've been talking about a, a kind of a, an OSPO framework, and I can put it in the chat here in a second. But we've been talking about an OSPO framework and how we think about OSPOs as playing an important role within an organization and kind of the different things that OSPOs can do and what OSPOs might want to measure or think about within, within an organization. So one of the categories that we had talked about was um, with respect to education and thinking about how, how OSPOs play a role in, in education. Um, so I'm curious to understand, like, I suppose it's not just about like doing the starter project health metric model on communities, right? It's not just applying that model. It's, it's a lot of a lot of a lot of other things. And so, I'm curious as to how within your organization you have have addressed education with uh, whether it's community members or it's you know with your corporate employees, um, whether it's around security or legal or upstream or downstream community engagement do people do people have things that they do inside of their companies or, or organizations and what does that sort of look like or where does it appear you know uh, I'm happy to jump in and yeah, take yeah. the first swing against uh most of this that I think um different parts of uh large organizations especially have pockets of knowledge that falls across uh, to bring back something that we just stopped calling a maturity model. <laughs> There's like a maturity model for um, the understanding within an organization of legal risk, of security compliance, and of how to engage with the community. And I think that uh, OSPOs generally have to be strategic about which communities they engage with first, because Obviously, if there's a team that doesn't know a whole lot about legal um, issues that might be in their open source dependencies, then it's going to be more work to deal with that problem than it is to help folks who are aware that that is something that can happen that are engaged with trying to solve the issue. So it's like there's the, the education of uh, why these issues are important that feels like the baseline of making sure that folks in the organization are aware that legal um, and security and community engagement are important within the company. And then how much bandwidth those organizations have to actually tackle those problems is a whole other like maturity model gradient because some organizations may have folks who are more than willing to, oh, you've told me that this is an issue I need to solve. Great. I'm putting it on my sprint. It's going to happen within the next couple of weeks or a month or whatever. And there's other parts of the organization that will decide that they do want to hand that they don't want to handle it. And you need to provide an easier path through automation, through things like renovate or things like, um, you know, automatic uh, approvals, or maybe you need to full on restrict dependencies from coming in and out. So I, I think about it in, um, I think about addressing education with those two like factors of how much do we think that this part of an organization knows or that this organization knows in general, and then how much work, uh, how much bandwidth would they have to deal with the issue? Uh, how urgent does an average engineering team or the average leadership uh, or piece of that org take this problem? Thanks. Yeah, Alyssa. Uh, I'll take a I'll take a swing, but I, I think first of all, I think this is a great question, um, and I have been surprised with how much I think um, uh, like our, our office is about education um, and and documentation. I feel like the two those two are are really closely intertwined, and and so what we try to I I think a lot about like and and. You brought this up, Gary. Like, what is your essentially the strat your strategy for that? Um, I think our strategy is to document um, as much as we can, um, uh, which is a constantly moving target. So, and and again, 
really humbled that um, so much of this work is about documentation. Um, and then, and then another thing that we do in part because it's a pretty small team is that we lean into um, already existing um, spaces of education, whether that's like the people that are coming in as first, you know, the first year or sorry, the, yeah, the first year training or even our internship program or existing like speaker series, you know, like what, whatever those tidbits are to try to, um, pe I feel like people are getting their learnings from so many different places. And so we, we throw a really broad net because we don't necessarily want to develop a whole entire like, you know, educational curriculum that maybe somebody will show up to, but rather like kind of piece in like open source throughout like the entire conversation. And then, you know, maybe we're like 10% successful. <laughs> I, I love and, then, that. and then you go to sleep. <laughs> I feel like your your comment on documentation was just like, yes, yes, all the yes. Um, I was gonna say, I feel like when I think about it, I think about it as two buckets, the like the need to know and the nice to know. Uh, anything that's need to know is a hard compliance or policy requirement that has been decided on over the years. And so those sorts of things often get embedded in training and require training. So like onboarding of new software engineers, uh, there's just a lot of open source stuff coming in out of the company. And so I think it's, there we have a couple of things that did get bubbled up to that just mandatory onboarding training. And we're looking into having that be more recurring, but clearly there's so much more information that's nice to know, depending on your level of engagement and what you want to know in, around this space. Um, and so that is what ends up being in our documentation. Um, so there's sort of the like explicit process guidance um, that's all going into documentation um, and as well as other types of educational events. We've also run some internal events to just like provide more space to have these conversations um, as well as making ourselves available as sort of internal strategy consultants. Um, because sometimes, yes, we have all this documentation, but having a 30 minute conversation can be much more succinct sometimes and help people understand exactly what they need to know and how they can apply it. Um, and I think in terms of like, there's definitely a boil the ocean problem because um, there's so many things that we could know. Uh, and so I think there, um, I've, I've been helping to run more internal feedback programs within our OSPO. Um, when I say it's, it's not exactly on behalf of OSPO anymore because there's so much open source work and supporting work happening that's not even our, on our team anymore. So I now look at it as sort of open source contributor experience feedback. Uh, and so the feedback that we get is applied to a whole number of teams. Um, but one of the things that we're asking explicitly now is where do you want more education? Where do you want more training? So having more spaces for our constituents to say where, where we're doing well, where we're not doing well enough and where we could have more. Other, this is super helpful, thank you. Other places where education or training shows up within the organization. Do do any of you track the impact? Oh, Alyssa, you had it. Yeah, sorry, I started yeah. yapping to myself, but um, I will also say that I feel like this is a very slow process. Like, um, again, also humbling that, um, you know the the patience this this work re requires too. Um, do you do you for those for those of you that are doing education within your organization or communities? Do you try to track the success of that and the impacts of that education, or do you just deliver it and <laughs> like all good? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, partially through our, our feedback survey, just like okay. we ask it in both like, a, how are we doing as well as an awareness? Like, did you know this policy existed? Um, and then there's sort of the indirect feedback, which is how successful are our compliance policies in terms of how many things are in and out of policy, or it's like how many exceptions are being run because people don't really understand policy or clearly missing something in training. Um, 
we found it to be super draconian and it's very much like a risk management thing of how much out of compliance issues lead to action versus just like clearly our trainings aren't penetrating deep enough because there are x number of people that are still not compliant um and so that's that's one of the main at least on the compliance sense um the educational one is it, it's hard to know what's really sinking in um and so i'd be curious to know what how others are looking at that We, yeah, Brian. Just, yeah, and I, I think different different organizations are going to de need different kind of education roles because part of my job is also running the enablement and training team within OSPO. We don't have to teach about compliance because at Red Hat, all the engineers are given um, permission to, you know, pick licenses and things like that. And we don't have any proprietary software with which to conflict. But we have a problem because since right before COVID, and this isn't public information, but it's not super secret, but 49% of being our- being recorded. Okay. Well, let's just say a lot of people at Red Hat are new. Um, and that's fair to say. So we have a cultural problem more than anything, not just in, you know around how to do open source. We have like um, an open and collaborative uh, culture and an environmental problem that we're trying to deal with too. And, and that's sort of what we're trying to uh, address as well. What is, what is the, what's the issue? Like environmental, what does that mean? It means that over the years during our particular growth, we, you know, we had basically hired everybody that we almost everybody that we could who was really good at open source. And now when we hire people, everybody is either working for another company and not looking for another job, or they don't know anything about open source. They're coming from proprietary software companies, or they're coming straight out of school where open source ne is not necessarily a taught thing. Um, so we have a real, our problem now is to get people, you can say, Open source means do all of these things, but legit, like logistically and culturally, they may not be familiar with that. The, the concept of upstream first, which is something we do at Red Hat and a lot of the other OSPOs do, you can say that, but it, they don't understand what that means, you know? And so we're, we are, re-engaging our training around that kind of thing. And that's part of why we actually reached out to the inner, <coughs> we're working with the inner source commons now because they have a lot of technical level documentation around that. Um, and we have a lot of strategic documentation that they need. So we're sort of um, uh, collaborating with them now on this. Gotcha. Uh, super helpful. Thank you. Do you track any, Brian, do you track any of the success of the training? We will. We, we haven't started yet. I mean, we're, we're, we're working, we're working with our existing internal training partners. Um, they will be tracking it, but we are, we are in very much in uh, content delivery mode at this point. Okay. Fair enough. Thanks. Uh, all right, this is super helpful. Um, any other thoughts from people? From training, education, do you wish universities did it for you? Hmm. <laughs> uh, for what it's worth, there, there may be some, uh, some relief there. The, University open source program offices are starting to really take hold at a number of universities and the recognition of open source activities in the university. I don't think it's in the interest necessarily of, of helping corporations or organizations. I think it's in the interest of helping the university themselves. But as a result, <laughs> some of that knowledge may start making its way out as students graduate and are just kind of participants in talking about open source a little bit more strategically in their classes, in the university, and 
for what it's worth. It's still a long way away. There's only like maybe 10 open source program offices at universities in the country. And there's a lot more universities than that in the country. So, okay, cool. Thank you. You're still up, Matt. You got the next one too. This one should be relatively short. So I just wanted to give people an update on the to-do book chapter. So there's a link right there. Um, basically, <laughs> these conversations that we have here are helping inform the book chapter. Um, so we had kind of proposed to help Anna at the to-do group uh, put together a book chapter. She's putting together a book for open source program offices and our chapter would be around metrics. And so how, you know, what are ways that we could think about particular areas of interest? And you can kind of see the framing in that book chapter. Um, so like last time we talked about, do you remember we talked about the discovery, how people go about discovering open source in their organizations? So that's like something that would be in this book chapter. Like if you're going to use metrics, maybe the first thing you have to do is like know how you can even discover the open source and what are ways that you can, you can do that discovery. Um, this is, this would be around education, particularly in the OSPOs, like what are the metrics that you could use to help understand education within, within the OSPO sense. And so this is a conversation a little bit about that. Um, and so I just wanted to also let you know that Nicole Huseman is also offered to help with this book chapter, um, from the LF. So thank you, Nicole. Nicole is a, currently a co-director of the board for the chaos project. Uh, and she had offered to provide some help in writing. And anybody on this call can also provide any can also provide help in writing. That's okay. That's okay too. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to frame it out first. And I don't think these chapters are very long. If you've ever taken a look at at to do group things, you know what I mean. They're just usually fairly short and to the point, which is great. Um, so anyway, I'll just continue to work on it and keep you posted on the updates. That's it for me on that one. Sure. I want to ask specifically what, how can we help? Do we just start hacking away on the Google Doc or are you looking for us to join a Slack channel or working group? Or uh, that's a good question. So <laughs> I think for the, for the, what would most, uh, gosh, I don't know. Let me think about that. All right. I just like throw something out. I'm like to start hacking on the document. Like, I don't know if that is the best approach. So maybe just reach out to me on Slack might be the easiest thing, but I'll also send something out to the channel once I think of the most sensible way to connect. Okie dokie. Sounds great. All right. It is uh, 43 out of 50. And I want to mm -hmm. take a second mm -hmm. and ask if anybody has any other agenda things, thoughts, feelings, hopes, or dreams that they'd like to express before we wrap up the call. I'll jump into my hopes and dreams, but be before that, <laughs> wondering if anybody here is going to be in Spain for um, Open Source Summit Europe. Um, I'd love to connect connect with you. Okay, um, we got one hand. Don Otherwise, be, we'll send photos. Don uh, will be there too. Okay, okay. Um, we'll we'll send photos for the for the TikTok, right? That's what the kids are doing. No, <laughs> I did not sign up for TikToks. Wait, what? <laughs> Me no. either. Hold on. Yeah, I'm, I'm on. kidding. Okay, don't worry. We're too old. There's, there's so. no chaos talk? Okay. Um, Is there? There is a chaos panel. I yeah. I think there is. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant like TikTok chaos talk. Oh, like, nice. You know, kind of, sorry about that. <laughs> don't quit your gay job. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, brilliant. I'm also too old. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, Classic dad joke. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, with that, uh, I think that's it. Uh, see in Spain who will be in Spain and see everybody else next time. That's great. Bye, Bye all. Thank you. Thanks.